Hiya, just want to look today at the fourth church in this set of the seven churches that Jesus speaks to and writes to in the book of Revelation and it's the church in Sardis. It's in Revelation chapter 3 verses 1 to 6. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works and that you have a name that you are alive but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die for I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember therefore how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore if you will not watch I will not I will come upon you as a thief and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names even in Sardis who have not defiled their garments and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot his name out from the book of life, but will, I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who is an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You know, it starts off in the exact same way as all the rest of them, to the angel of the church off and taking the angel as that supernatural being, the guardian angel the church in Sardis and it's interesting because Sardis used to many years centuries before John wrote this letter Sardis was a very important city it was very important as a military base it was like a stronghold it was built in a high plateau the Acropolis was about 1500 feet above the valley below where there was roads uh, Sardis is a city that was about 50 miles east of Ephesus and it was at a junction of five main roads and so therefore it was a place where there was a lot of trade, it was important for trade, it was a place that was the emperors, the rulers of it in the different kingdoms and the different groups that ruled it over centuries believed it was impregnable and it was one of these places that was fought over often and most of the time it was never captured but twice it was taken and it, both times it was taken in a sense in a sneaky way it was taken without a big battle being fought and uh, the siege being sort of completed and the city broken down it there was a sort of circular way a behind the back door one of those was when the guy who was the famous emperor, Croeus, I think is how you pronounce his name, around about 546 or 547 BC, the Lydian Empire that he was the final emperor of, uh, he uh, was fighting with the Persians and it was Cyrus, Cyrus of the Isaiah Bible, biblical fame and of Daniel and that side of it. And Cyrus was invading and Cyrus was leading the Persians and there was an expansion going on and they were becoming the superpower, the main power in that region at the time. And so Croeus retreated to Sardis at the end of the day, he was a little more driven back by the Persians and while he was there uh, Cyrus and the Persian army laid siege to the city for 14 days and there was just, it was just immovable. The, Lydian forces, they believed that the, they were in a de totally and utterly defensible position. They believed that the, it was impregnable where they were and that the Persians would never take them. And they just felt if they held out, then Persians, a good chance they would go away. But one of the Persian soldiers, when he was watching the stronghold, the city, he saw one of the walls that was supposed to be impregnable he saw a soldier a Lydian soldier climbing down and then he noticed when he got down to the bottom that he picked up a helmet his helmet had fallen over the wall and he climbed back up the wall so this Persian soldier climbed up the wall as behind him and after him and discovered that he could get up and because he was able to do that many many more of the Persian army climbed that wall and entered the city and took over and uh, the Lydians and Croes was uh, were defeated and the Persians became the power in Sardis at that point. 
I mean, Sardis went from many through many different hands. There was the ones before the Lydians, there was the Lydians, there was the Persians, then there was the Greeks under Alexander, and then there were the Romans. And it was at the time of the Roman conquest, the time of the Roman occupation, as in all of Asia Minor that we are at now at this point with John and Patmos exiled there, banished there. And this city that is, uh, you could say it known better days it was famous I mean a few maybe 20 30 years before this there was a massive earthquake and Sardis was really destroyed and there was a major rebuilding of the city and the Roman Emperor gave quite a lot of money to help with the rebuilding and he let the city off from paying taxes for so long just so they could get it up and running again it was a place where there was much industry. There was a wool industry like there was where in Theatira where Lydia came from. And there was also the different religions there. There was quite a large synagogue. I mean it, when that synagogue was finally fully developed, which would probably have been after this, it was the length of a football, or one of our modern day football pitches, a huge thing. There was a quite an established Jewish community in Sardis and there doesn't seem to have been any persecution. And so as people became Christians and people came to Christ, there doesn't seem to have been any persecution of them. They seem to have been given the freedom to worship and the freedom to follow their faith, even if they came out of the different temples. And like in Ephesus and like in many of the cities, there was a temple to Artemis or Diana. There was different temples. There was a temp temple to Demeter, who was a female goddess again like uh, Artemis or Diana and a fertility goddess and uh, the Greeks took over that goddess really from the Asian sort of community, the Asian background there and when the Romans came they sort of added to the sort of tradition of Demeter by turning Demeter into being the sort of a deified uh, god, a deified emperor, I can't remember the emperor's name but his mother Leva. And so the, there was a real mixture, a coming together of all the different religions, a real sense of syncretism. People would go to different temples. People had bits of each other's beliefs up here. Something. It's a bit like today where people will pick up a bit from here and a bit from there, a bit from this religion, a bit from that religion, a bit from the New Age, a bit from philosophy. And in a sense it's a self-service or a pick and mix type of religion and people tend to sort of feel they can get by on that. And Sardis was a bit like that. Sardis had a great history. If you looked in the library at Sardis and looked up the history books and you looked at the different emperors, the different kingdoms, the different groups that had been there, yeah, it was quite, an, quite a history, quite a major history as a military place and quite an important place strategically at that. There was uh, five roads that met, the sort of crossroad type thing. Uh, be down in the valley from where it was situated. It had control and was used to being in control. And it's to this city that knew better days, this city that had been so badly damaged by an earthquake, this city that was used to different kings coming and emperors coming and taking over, albeit by deceit some of the time. And it was to this city that Jesus sends this the fourth letter of the seven to tell them something that he wanted to tell them to speak to them and he begins by saying these things says he who is the seven spirits of God and the seven stars and the seven spirits of God occur in chapter 1 verse 4 the description of God the Father and God's throne and at the, about the seven spirits of God there that is a sort of symbol of the Holy Spirit seven the number of perfection seven the number of completion and the spirit the Holy Spirit being complete going back to Isaiah the spirit of wisdom and discernment and that side of it and also the seven angels and it, the, it says that he has them in his hand in Revelation chapter 6 and 1 verse 16 and in verse 20 it explains that the seven angels are the angels of the churches or the seven stars rather the angels of the churches that Jesus has in his hands and it's the seven 
I, as I say, I believe it's like guardian angels, overseeing angels, so we're looking after the life of the church and from a spiritual perspective in that sense. And Jesus says that he is this one. He is the one who walks amidst the candlesticks. He is the one who has the churches and the angels of the churches in his hands. He is the one who has the fullness and has a spirit without limit and without measure. As John says, he is the one that is speaking into this church. And what he says to this church is, I know your works. Again, it's part of the pattern to the angel off. And then there's the the sort of taking from chapter one something the description of who Jesus is and taking that and saying this is the one who's speaking to you and then he says I know your works that you have a name that you're alive but you're dead it's quite a horrific thing to actually say to this church that it has a name that it's alive but really it's dead I mean if you think of it Jesus in chapter one in verse 18 and in chapter 2, verse 8, when he speaks to the, and I'll just read it, in verse 18, he, Jesus says, uh, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. In 2, verse 8, to the church in Smyrna, these things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. And Jesus identifies himself as one who was dead and came back to life, one is alive forevermore. But he identifies this church as one who is supposed to be alive, has a reputation of being alive, but is actually dead. It's like a reversal. It's a church that is living in a past glory. It's a church like the city, has a tremendous history probably. But something along the line has gone wrong, and that's no longer true of this church. It's no longer true of the city, but it's certainly no longer true of this church, that this church is alive. And I wonder, you know, sometimes we can do, we can be like that. You know, we can have a reputation. We can, people can remember perhaps when we were converted. People can remember things that we did as Christians that can, the life of Christ was in us, the life of the Spirit was in us. And they remember that, or we remember that. And we sort of think back to that. But we really don't have that relationship with God anymore. We might have a relationship on a sort of horizontal level with brothers and sisters in Christ, with the church, we might have that relationship and people might think, well, you, I, am a really good Christian. But vertically, it's like we're dead. Vertically, we no longer have that sense that uh, Jesus said to the Ephesian church, remember, you've left your first love, you've lost your first love. Return to that and do the first works. We're like that. But it seems that Sardis was a step further along the way. They'd become, in a sense, totally lazy. They were living under past experience. They were like a snowball gathering the momentum that of the snowball becoming bigger and going down the hill. The momentum carries it on. It's not the life of the snowball. It's just the momentum. And this church seems to have been living in a momentum of its past, the momentum of its past experiences, of its past glories, of its past triumphs and of its past living for Christ. And there's a danger if we don't keep that vertical connection with God, if we don't keep worshipping God, if we don't keep that relationship with God and our love for God and our experience of God's love, if we don't keep that as something that is living in his life, then there's a danger that what happens is we have this reputation of being alive but we're dead dead man walking in a sense you know dead church moving dead church existing in that sense because people remember the past people remember the glory days in different places that we've ministered in our lives but there have been churches that once were great but had become warehouses or had become temples or mosques and that type of thing to other religions because their heyday had passed and they lived off that for a while, but eventually as people died off or moved away, nobody knew there was no new life coming in. And so the church died and the building became occupied by something else or someone else. You have a reputation, you have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. Don't let that be true of you and I. Please God, don't let that ever be true of me. That ought to be our prayer today. 
And Jesus says to this church, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. They're not there yet in death in that sense as a church. I have not found your works perfect or complete before God. Be watchful. Twice this city was taken by deceit. One of the times was when Cyrus's Persian forces climbed up after seeing one of the Lydian soldiers climb down. They saw a way into the city and the forces up, up in the city, they were sort of not bothering. They thought that they were totally secure and totally safe because they, they felt they were in an impregnable position. And so they weren't watchful. And the enemy came in and the empire, the Lydian Empire, finished and the Persian Empire came into being there in Sardis. And Jesus is in a sense, taking a leaf out of their history book and saying, be watchful. Don't assume everything's going to be all right. Don't assume that you're going to carry on. Don't assume that the church will always be there. Don't assume that your relationship doesn't need anything done to it. The enemy's about prowling like a roaring lion, as Peter says. And Jesus says to this church, strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die or about to die. And I want to say to you today, if you're a believer or if you're part of a church, that this is true of a glorious history, a name that we're, you're alive, but actually inside you know and inside your church or inside your life you know there's a spiritual deadness there. I want to say to you today, and just I want to say in Jesus' name to encourage you, Strengthen what's there. Strengthen it through the word of God. Strengthen it through prayer and fasting. Strengthen it through witnessing and through evangelism. Strengthen it through Bible teaching. Strengthen it through fellowship. Strengthen it through just getting down to doing the work of God and spreading the message of Christ. Strengthen it by becoming part of the community and bringing the good things of God and God's desire for the community in what is called nowadays social action what used to be called the social gospel with that but bring along with it the gospel of Jesus Christ the hope the good news of salvation the good news that God can turn things around and as people are converted and turned to Christ that society can be changed one at a time one at a time people getting saved one at a time one brick at a time one block at a time a wall is built and it's the same with a church being built with people and it's the same with a city or a town or a village being transformed. And Jesus says to this church, strengthen that which remains. It's not dead. It's like the fire where the, it's just almost like embers that are there. There's just a bit of a glow at the very centre of it. It would been raging fire burning. And now you can just about feel the heat if you put your hand over it. It looks dead, but you, just visible is that tiny red glow. And all it takes is a bit more fuel. All it takes is a bit of the breath or the wind to come along and to blow that ember, to light the fire, to get the flame, to enlarge the flame so it becomes bigger. And as fuel is put onto it, the fire reaches up again. Well, that, the fuel that it is, is important in churches and for building churches and for strengthening churches is prayer. The fuel is Bible teaching. The fuel is evangelism. The fuel is living our lives for Christ and for one another. The fuel is that we love each other and that people recognize the love of Christ in us for one another. And they say, look how they love each other. And it's because of Christ, Christ's love in us. And Christ in us, the hope of glory. It's never the end. We don't have to give up. And Jesus is saying to this church in Sardis, you don't have to give up. Strengthen what remains. Strengthen what remains if you've stopped doing your devotions, if you've stopped reading the Bible, if you've stopped talking to God, if you've stopped praying. Strengthen what remains if you've stopped praying for your family. Strengthen what remains if you've stopped sharing with people about Jesus. Ask God to give you opportunities to tell others about Christ. But get yourself right with God. Most importantly is what the message of this church is. Because I have not found your works complete before God or perfect before God. This is a church that hadn't finished the task 
it was supposed to finish. It wasn't facing persecution and being stopped doing the task. It wasn't facing persecution from the other religions, from the Jewish faith. It wasn't facing civic or governmental persecution from the Roman Empire. It wasn't facing that at all. It had just gone into a sort of standby mode. We're used to the, what it means to go into standby when we leave a computer or we leave our tellies or we leave different things to go into standby. If they're not being used for a while, they go into standby and nothing seems to be happening. There's a potential while a thing's in standby for it to go. And that's what this church was in. And maybe that's what your life is like. You're in standby mode. You're not advancing in Christ. You're, you've, you just have stopped living for Christ. You've just stopped following Christ. You've just stopped serving Christ. And that's what was going on in this church. They hadn't completed their task. And you and I have not completed our task. What the thing that God wants us to do, we won't have completed till the day we stand before Christ in glory. That's, I think that's one of the great things. What more can I do? I often think, well, I can keep going on. I can keep praying. I can keep teaching. I can keep reading the Bible. I can keep doing my devotions. I can keep serving Christ. I can keep telling people about Jesus. Because one day, I want to shut my eyes in this world and I want to open them in the next. And I know my next stage is to, is to worship, to enjoy the fellowship of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to worship Him for eternity. This God has given us a task. Sometimes we don't know what the task is and we need to spend time in prayer. We need to really get to grips with what God is saying to us through the Holy Spirit and his word. But this church hadn't completed its task. As long as people were in Sardis, it didn't matter its history, it didn't matter the situation that Sardis was in, the population could go down, its reputation could go down. It needed believers and they didn't seem to be doing that task of making Christ known. They didn't seem to be doing that task of living for Christ in Sardis. The church seemed to have lost that. And the whole thing is that he, Christ then says to them, Remember therefore how you have received and heard. That's in verse 3. How you have received and heard. How did they receive? They received because someone preached the gospel to them. They received because they heard the gospel. They received because someone told them. They received because someone shared them. Someone came to them. And that's what Jesus is saying to them. Not just remember what you heard. Not remember just the past. But remember how you received it. You received it by faith. And faith comes by hearing. As Paul says in Romans. You heard the word. And perhaps there's a little bit in that, that that's something that had gone on, that was going on in Sardis. They were not really bothering with the word. And the word is important because Jesus says, John 15, now are you clean through the word that I've spoken to you. Psalm 119 says that God's word is a lamp to our path, our feet and a light to our pathway. God, the word of God Give, shows us how we should live. The Word of God shows us what we should believe. The Word of God shows us how we should behave, behave to one another. And most of all, the Word of God shows us how we can be saved and how we can grow in Christ. And Jesus is saying to that church, Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast. Hold tight. Hold on to Jesus and repent. Hold on to what you know to be true. Even, you know, when we don't experience it, even when we feel that we're not experiencing the fullness of life, the joy of the Lord is your strength, Nehemiah said. Even when we're not feeling that, hold fast. Even when we feel nobody else is doing this, nobody else is living for Christ, nobody else is following Christ, hold fast. Hold on, hold tight on to Jesus. Hold tight on to what you know. It's a cliche, but don't doubt in the dark what you saw in the light and discovered in the light. Hold on to Jesus and he'll take us through. Like Simon Peter when he was sinking after he came out of the boat because Jesus told him to come to him. And he looked around and saw the waves and the wind and he started to take his focus off Christ and he started to sink and he called help. And Jesus reached down and held on to him. And you can bet anything Simon Peter held on to Christ. He held fast. 
and they go into the boat together. And Jesus is saying to this church, hold fast, hold tight onto what you believe. Therefore, if you will not watch, again, it's that word watch, be watchful. In verse 2, be watchful. If you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what I will come. You will not know what hour I will come upon you. You know, Matthew 24, verse 43, Jesus was speaking and Jesus was talking about this, and it's a verse that's really sort of resonates and it's a verse that really is the same message Jesus saying, said but know this that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief would come he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into I've, n I've never been burgled when we were in Manchester someone broke into our shed and someone broke into our garage and stole stuff and it was a bad enough feeling that if I'd known that somebody was going to come and do that I would have been sitting at my window and I'd knock Thieves don't come with calling cards. Thieves don't announce I'm going to be in your area on Wednesday and I'll be robbing your house at nine o'clock when you leave to go to work. We don't know when they come. There's a suddenness about it. There's an unexpectedness about it. And there's a shock about it. And what Jesus is saying is that not that he's going to come to steal, but he's going to come in that way. There's going to be a suddenness, an unexpectedness. And we're going to get a shock that he's going to come back. First Thessalonians 5, 2, Jesus, Paul said, For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. We don't know when Christ is going to come back, but it's going to happen suddenly. And for many it's going to be a shock. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with great noise, and the elements will be burnt, will melt with fervent heat, both the earth and the works that are in them will be burnt up. Jesus, when he returns, is not announcing it. Jesus has given signs and some of the stuff we don't fully understand. But one day, we're going to see Jesus coming back. We're not probably going to expect it, in the sense that we won't get up that morning and look at our watch and think, well, in an hour, Jesus come by. It's going to happen. All of a sudden, it's going to happen. And Jesus is saying to this church that he is going to judge them like that if they don't keep watch. They need to be keeping watch. The Lydian army under Croesus needed to be keeping watch in that wall, that sort of escarpment, that, that side when the Cyrus's Persian army scaled it after seeing a Lydian soldier climbing it. They needed to be keeping watch, but they didn't think they had to. They thought they were safe. And Jesus is saying to this church, don't take God, the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit for granted. Keep watch. And I will, because I'm going to come suddenly like a thief. And you're not going to know what hour I'm going to come. And he's talking about coming in judgment to this church as well as coming in judgment to the world. We need to be those that keep watch. We need to be those that are watching. We need to be those that are keeping and looking for and hastening by evangelism and by the way that we live for Christ the day of the Lord. Jesus is coming back. I can't tell you when. No man can tell you when. But Jesus is coming back. There's an hour set. There's a moment set in the plan of God that Jesus Christ is going to come back. That is not going to be brought forward and that is not going to be put back. It's fixed and Christ is going to come. And we need to be those that are found watching and expecting and holding on to that that is going to happen. That's part of the Christian hope. Not just that we're going to heaven, but Jesus Christ is coming back and everything is going to be sorted. Yes, there's going to be judgment. There's going to be pain. There's going to be separation. But Jesus is coming back. There's going to be shock like when a thief comes. And we need to be those that are ready and keeping watch and Jesus says to them you have a few names even in Sardis who have not defiled their garments and they shall walk with me in white for they are worthy it's not a whole church Jesus is talking to There's, there are those that were in this church in Sardis who were really trying to live for Christ and were really trying to 
just do what Jesus would want them to do, that were trying to demonstrate the love of Christ to those around them. You know, it's interesting that in many of the temples in, uh, in this age, in this time, that you wouldn't be allowed into the temple if your clothes were dirty or soiled. You had to have clean clothes on to go into the temple. And Jesus says about these, there are many in e names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled the garments. You're, you know, if you defiled garments didn't get you into the presence of your God, your pagan God. And what Jesus is saying is there are those that have kept out, out of the mess, whether it's immorality, whether it's idolatry, whether it's some other sin. There are those that are trying to live holy lives to God. There are those that are trying to copy and to sort of be like Jesus and talk about Christ and pray and ask God for his help. And Jesus says they shall walk with me in white garments. Now the white, white is a sign of purity in the Bible in that sense of the white garments you've got in Revelation 4 and 5. The martyrs are before the throne of God they're dressed in white garments, white robes that have been washed in the blood of Christ. There's a sign of purity, there's a sign of perseverance, there's a sign of overcoming, there's a sign of victory because when the Romans held a victory parade, Roman citizens tended to dress in white. It was a sign of celebration, of overcoming. And that whole sense of walking in white garments is talking about being admitted into the presence of God, the presence of Christ, admitted into the heaven, admitted into what John sees in chapter 4 and 5 of the book of Revelation, the throne room of God, and the celebration that is going on around God's throne, and the worship that's going on around God's throne. That there are people in Sardis, in the church in Sardis, who will get in there because they've not defiled their garments, they've not made them dirty. And he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. Again, the victory. Also remember, this is a city that made garments and would have made white garments for the different temples and different things as well. It's interesting that in the temple in Jerusalem that the priest would have been wearing white garments and it can be that perhaps these white garments are an allusion to the fact that you and I are priests unto God and that these ones who overcome, the ones who are victory, victors, are going to be clothed in white garments. And Jesus also says I will not blot the, his name from the book of life but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. I mean the first reference to the book of life that is in the Bible is in Exodus 32 verses 32 to 33 where it says yet now if you will forgive their sin but if not I pray blot me out of your book which you have written. This is Moses praying because he wants God to forgive the children of Israel for what they've done. And the Lord said to Moses whoever has sinned against me I will blot him out of my book. In Daniel, when Daniel was there before God, in the, one of the visions Daniel sees in chapter 12, in the first verse, at that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. Of, in the book. Philippians 4 verse 3 it says and I urge you true companion help these women who labored with me in the gospel with Clement also and the rest of my fellows, fellow workers whose names are in the book of life and then it, in Revelation 20 towards the end at the judgment and before you know we see that other picture of heaven and I saw the dead small and great standing before God and books were opened and another book was opened which is the book of life and the dead were judged according to their works by, by the things that were written in the books. I wonder is your name in the Lamb's Book of Life? It means you're saved if it is. God writes our name in the Lamb's Book of Life, in the Book of Life. But the Book of Life can also refer to just our lives. And many in Sardis were dead. They weren't in the Lamb's Book of Life. They may have been in the Book of Life, but they weren't. They weren't Christians. They were probably nominal. They, probably their parents, their grandparents, relatives, or friends had been living Christians. 
full of fire. But many in this church were, had become just nominal in the sense that they believed certain things, but they didn't practice it. They believed certain things in their head, but it had never reached their heart. There had never been transformation. And Jesus says, to, the one that overcomes will not be blotted out. But I will confess his name to my Father and before the angels in heaven. It's a wonderful thing that Jesus says he'll confess our names. This one is mine and he'll say our name. This one mentioned in their name is mine. Jesus said in John chapter 10 and verses 30, Two and thirty-three. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father in heaven. You know, we confess Christ when we witness for him. We confess Christ by living for him. We confess Christ by believing in him and following him and becoming a Christian and by having a living faith in God, a living relationship with God through Jesus Christ. We confess Christ to the world. We confess Christ to God. The moment we invite Jesus Christ to come into our lives, the moment we call upon him and ask him to forgive us and to become our Lord and Saviour, at that moment we confess Christ. And the thing is that those that confess Christ and live for him, Jesus says he will confess before God our Father. He will confess before the angels that surround the throne of God. Jesus will confess you and I before God if we're those that overcome if we're those that watch, if we're those that take heed to this message to the church in Sardis and don't allow the fire to go out, don't allow the relationship to burn cold in that sense. Jesus is reminding this church that it needs to do something about its spiritual state and its spiritual situation before it dies. And Jesus closes this letter by saying to the church what he says to every other one of them. He that has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I don't know if you've heard something from the Spirit of God today as we thought about the church in Sardis. I don't know if you've heard Jesus saying to you, watch, be watchful, strengthen what remains and is about to die. I don't know if you've heard that. If you've heard that, then do something about it. If you've heard that, then ask God to help you to revive and come into a revived state, to revive the flame of God and the fire of God in your life, to revive that sense of the love of God in your life. If you've heard something else that the Spirit is saying to you, do it. That's what we're supposed to do. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. What the Spirit says to the church is not just for your edification, but so that we do it, so that we live for Christ in that way. God loves you. God doesn't want the flame to go out. God doesn't want your church to die. God wants us as we serve him, as we love him, and as we love one another, as we share Christ and we get to know Christ at a deeper level and a fuller level day by day God wants to revive our churches God wanted to do that for Sardis and this church in Sardis may God do the same for you Father we just want to ask in the mighty name of Jesus Christ that you would bless us today and help us I just want to say to you pause just now and think about your own life and think about the things that we've been talking about to do with this letter. Is any of it true of you? Second thing, before you pause again, I want to ask you is, how did you hear the gospel? How did you receive the gospel? I want you to pause again and think for a little while about how you came to know Christ and how you heard how you receive Christ. Let's just pause for a moment then. And the third thing, and the final thing is, let's pray today that God will revive our church, that God will revive his church throughout Coventry and throughout the UK and throughout the world. And if you know a church that's struggling and 
sometimes people can be critical of churches it's dead easy to be critical of churches really but let's not be critical let's ask God to strengthen what remains in each church let's ask God to blow by the Holy Spirit if there's a church that is dying if, if it's our church that God would blow by the Holy Spirit on that ember and that God would place fuel make me the your fuel oh fire of God make me your fuel Amen God bless you